very much. It's very informative. This time I'll take questions. Gail. Good evening. Uh, I'm Gail Simpson. I'm an alderman here on the city of Springfield. <clears throat> and I represent probably an area on this map, which would be uh, in red. Um, what I find interesting is um, we talk about an attorney general grant. Is that a grant for municipalities? Or how, how did you uh, find out about it? How did you apply for it? When is it up? Can you answer some yeah. of those questions? Um, so the, the funding comes from um, some of the bank settlements for, for the mortgage issues. Um, the, the attorney general got a big chunk of that money from the settlements with the banks. Um, and, and about maybe a year and a half ago, the, the application process was opened up to people in the state. Um, a lot of partnerships got it, not necessarily municipalities. Uh, the municipality couldn't be a lead on it, I believe. You could only be a partner in it. You had to have a, a nonprofit organization be the lead in it. Ours was um, LIST, was our nonprofit organization, and we partnered with LIST, um, IFF, which is a, a nonprofit lender, um, and then four or five local neighborhood organizations. And the city was, was a partner on it and really helped with the application process, but couldn't be the lead agency. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to know, um, can you tell me when the last time the city of Peoria did a major restructuring in their uh, ordinances? Because this city just did that about three years ago. So um, how long has it been? In what, which ordinances? The ordinances that you guys are involved in, the uh, so, property ordinances. Uh, the rental registration ordinance, um, we changed about five years ago to go to an annual registration. Um, this new I'm talking ordinance. about before this new, this new round. Um, how long has it been? It's a always evolving process. I don't think we've had a major overhaul. It's more of a, a, a new process, tweak as you go. I don't think we've ever, um, I, I don't remember the last time we did a complete overhaul of, of the ordinance. Oh, well, this city just did a major overhaul about three years ago and it's starting to work well. Good, that's great. I, I you know, I, York talked about kind of working with neighborhoods and working with residents. I, I like to think that I hired York to be the nice guy, and sometimes I'm the mean one with the ordinance enforcement. Um, but you really need the strong enforcement in place. You need the ordinances to, to tell, you know, and, and sometimes people think government is getting too involved in stuff, but what I tell someone when they call and, and they're mad that, that we ask them to cut their grass or pick up their weeds or pick up their brush, I say, Especially when it's a landlord, would you want to live that by that? No. You know, if it's a homeowner occupied and, and you know a lot of times with our owner occupied houses, sometimes they don't realize what, what the ordinance is and we can work with you then. But but having strong enforcement in place and then having a strong legal department who's who's willing to, to take the next step on those ordinance enforcement and and, and and go after the uncollected fines and the uncollected bills and really hold people accountable for, for what um, ordinances you're elected to. Yes. You use TIF money to rehab houses, and do uh, you require prevailing wage for uh, TIF projects? Um, we do not, at this moment, have, we have not used TIF funds to redevelop housing projects. What do you use it for? Um, the, the, the East Village Grow Cell TIF was really our first residential TIF project. Um, and, and it's, well, how long has it been in place? March, March of 2011, it was adopted. And, and the, the residents in, in that area are interested in um, having a housing um, rehab program funded by TIF funds. Um, and there's a draft of that program that's been put together in um, conjunction with the neighborhood residents. However, there's, um, because the TIF is newly formed, there's not sufficient um, increment in the TIF to really to support the program, so we don't want to create a false expectation. So the program has not been um, approved and open for application yet, but sometime in the, in the future, in the next few years or so, it's likely that there would be um, a housing program. And to answer your second part of the question about safe prevailing wage, um, I would ask that to our attorney and have him tell me. Um, <laughs> if he thinks we should or not. So I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I think a lot of it would depend on how you're structuring the programs, whether you're, the resident is actually doing it himself, and, and I'm not a lawyer, so. Michelle? Um, okay, so let's say that I'm a, I'm a slow board and the city cites me for being in, in violation or I failed to register for the annual inspection. I board my property and I leave it vacant. Can you kind of walk me 
through the process and the time frame, if I'm completely uncooperative, what what happens next at the city level and what's the approximate time from start to finish where the city would actually take down my property if I didn't cooperate? Yes, um, it, it's not the quickest process, and I apologize because I'm sure you are probably looking for a quicker process. Um, I, I can tell you that if I could do it quicker, I would. Um, so if you go out and you move out of your house, it's a vacant house, and, and um, depending on the severity of the violation will depend on what route we take. If it's just peeling paint and a damaged gutter and it's not really a, a demo candidate, um, you know, we'll put you in our administrative hearing process. Um, 35 days from the day our inspection is, you go in front of our administrative hearing officer. Um, if you show up, um, we'll create a work scope with you of, of what you need to get done within a two-week increment. If you meet that two-week increment, you paint the house these two weeks, the next two weeks you do your gutter, we, we drop the case. If you don't, our, we have a very strong administrative hearing officer who greatly believes in neighborhood, so he will find you a lot for bringing your property into compliance. Especially if you're a landlord and, and you've been in front of him before, he, he doesn't seem to, he has a very good memory that he's seen you before. Um, and, you know, but if we go out and your house is boarded up, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's much more damaged than just what we just want to put you through our administrative hearing officer, um, we'll go to the, the circuit court to get a, a demolition order. Um, you know, we post the house, then after 15 days, we then have to serve everyone, serving people that are trying to, to not take care of their responsibility of their property is hard. Um, usually our demolition case, start to finish, take up to, to nine months to a year. Nine months to a year? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Who pays for the demolition? Uh, the city does. We, I mean, we put a lien on the property, but, but when you put a $10,000 lien on a vacant lot, um, the reality is that in three years, no one's probably paid the property tax on it, so it's gonna go to a county trustee auction, and then all liens are gonna get wiped off, so it usually is, is us. We've actually been, um, Lately, with our demolition program, we've been declaring properties abandoned. Um, in the state of Illinois, under state statute, you can declare a property abandoned if it meets three criteria. Um, the three criteria, you haven't paid property tax in two years, um, you don't have running water, it's a, it's a dangerous building and it's vacant. Um, and, and so we, we petition the court to declare it abandoned um, if, if no one shows up on behalf of that case. And we, the, the city actually gets ownership of the property. We've just started using that process maybe about a year ago um, and, and done it for about 30 or 40 properties. Um, you know, within our older parts of town, we realize that there's there's sometimes the only way we're gonna get development we go in the areas to develop a, a large cluster of lots. So that's kind of one of the approaches with the wellness plan we've taken is, is trying to, to, to declare some properties abandoned, get some ownership, and then take it back. Because if we're gonna pay for the cost of tearing the house down, and then I'm gonna have to cut the grass for the next four years anyways, we might as well be the, the deed holder of the property. How do you do your recycling up there? Um, like just regular recycling? Yeah, I mean, is it is a separate bill or is it included in your utility bill or how do you do yours? Um, it's, included in, it's included in your sanitation bill. I think, it, I think we provide once a month recycling and it's just included in your Sue? Um, I was interested in the comment you made, York, and it was when you're out meeting residents and uh, maybe in a neighborhood of low income where people have problems, structural problems, but they don't have the money to pay for them, um, and you said the city can help them. What, what can you do for those people? Um. Well, I'm not, I'm not in charge of grants, but we do, uh, we do have a few grants to, to help with roofing. Um, we're starting another new paint program. Uh, there's, and if it's, if it's not helpful in the city, we want to be able to point them in the right direction. Um, we don't want it to just be a phone call of a dead end. Um, so utilizing the, the few uh, development grants that we might have uh, to help people with, uh, with housing issues or, or water heaters, which can help me. Before the winter and everything comes there, we're seeing a lot of people now say, okay, have a broken water heater, it doesn't, it doesn't work, so there's some emergency funds there. Um, but the city does have a little bit of money to start helping residents, and, and usually it's in targeted areas. You know, if you have a brand new housing development, you're like, oh, I need a new roof. We're not going to say, okay, we're going to put a brand new roof yeah. on. 
I'm more concerned about low income areas. Right, and, and, and that's usually where the target area is. It would be the you know, red and yellow areas on the map for us. Do you have a special source of funding for that assistance or general revenues? Um, the, we have a working program that's a CDBG funds from, from this, the federal government. Um, our emergency grants are, are from the federal government. Uh, the paint program that we're, we're about to adopt is local funds, so just general revenue funds coming out of the general fund budget. Um, un unfortunately, you know, with the, with the way budgets have gone the last six or seven years, a lot of these programs have dried up money and, and giving helping residents. And, and you know, that's a tough balance for us to, of asking. And that's kind of, you know, with the wellness approach, you know, kind of an approach we're taking in, in, in the red area on the map, you know, if we need to, if you need help with your, your house being painted, we have a code inspector who, who, who does a very good job working with, with different social organizations and community service workers, and she has a, a very big heart. So if, 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 you, if she comes across your property and you need painting, I bet she can find someone to help you paint. Um, and and it's, it's sometimes I, I wish we could help more, and I wish we could offer more programs, to, but, but the money just isn't there like it once was with these. And then the other thing is, you know, with the federal funding, more and more, federal regulations about lead paint um, that you have to abate that, that that really drives the cost up to sometimes help. And so when, when cities get involved to try to help, a lot more regulations could kick in and, and the price goes up. So $50,000 to help renovate your house doesn't go very far when, when these other things kick in. What kind of budget do you have for that? Um, we, we do about Seventy, eighty thousand dollars, probably for roofs each year, and about fifty or sixty thousand in emergency repairs. And then the paint program, I think they just put a budget request in for fifty thousand, or twenty-five or fifty thousand. Twenty-five thousand for the paint program. Okay. What do you guys do with the money that you get collecting with fines? Um, it just goes into our general fund. Um, we don't specifically in market an account, so it's goes in with all the other taxes that we get. So we don't like put it back, like help the people that you're talking about here? Um, you know, based on the, the way the budget works, you know, we don't collect enough final revenue to pay for the whole budget. So it's not like we're, we're creating more than we're spending within the department delivery and service. The other thing I would say, you know, what when, when I find you, I don't really care if you pay me $50. I just want you to do a violation. Um, so, so I don't get as concerned, you know. I think sometimes people are like, we well, are collecting all those fines, like why aren't you getting those and putting back in the neighborhood? I, I would hope for a time when we don't collect any fines, because that means we're not writing tickets and you're complying with the ordinances. Um, but, but just as your property tax go to pay for police services and fire services, you pay for the community development department services, and, and we're not generating more money than, than we're spending on our, our service and our staffing, so it, it's, it's all one pot of money. Joe? Joe McMinniman, also all on the city council. I represent a mostly green area with an old commercial quarter that would be yellow, and then half the precinct would be red. And as far as that half the precinct would be red, it was a housing complex with a real problem landlord who had uh, a real history of housing code violations. And so what we did with respect to that particular landlord was we worked with the Springfield Housing Authority and asked them, based on the Federal Code of Regulations, to permit no additional Section 8 vouchers to go to that landlord. And this housing complex had about 80% Section 8 vouchers. So it was really a federally funded slump. And uh, that tool has been really effective. It had never, ever been used in Springfield before. And, um, I'm not sure if it's a tool that we could use even more aggressively in Springfield without a landlord, but my question is, have you used that tool in Peoria? Um, we, it's funny you ask that. Um, no, we haven't. However, um, we've actually, probably the last two months, had a lot of conversations with the Housing Authority about um, their Section 8 vouchers and, and who's getting where. They're, the city of Peoria is, is in the middle of, of uh, possibly Doing some things with our housing authority, um, so we've had a we had a pretty good relationship with them, of, of having some discussions with that. And, and we, and it's funny you asked that last week. I we are looking into something like that, so uh, we might be contacting Springfield to, to look into that a little further. Because I 
I mean, that's, you're absolutely right. When, when, when landlords, you know, what I've experienced with landlords is if they're collecting a rent check, rec, a rent check either from the federal government or just from a tenant, that's usually what they care about. And unfortunately, that's not what the city or neighborhood cares about. We care about being a contributing part to the neighborhood, so. Uh, yes, um, I'm interested in your ticketing system for violation of, um, you know, housing ordinances, um, particularly from like, what, what invokes, you know, the ticket for the violation and what's the time frame from the inspector's first notice that there's a violation of the ordinance until there has to be a resolution to the violation? Um, from a, from a, so we, we kind of separate our, our violations from in our ordinance, you know, um, if, if it's a housing violation, so it's a, something wrong with your house, we treat it separately than if it's an environmental violation with your yard or brush or a vehicle. So two parts to that question. So I kind of walked through how the housing case would work. Um, so an environmental case, if, if we've been out there within the last two years and, and we go out there again, we're going to write you a ticket. Um, the first time we go out there. Um, and if, if we go out there and, and you have, so we've been out there once for tall grass, we go back out there again for tall grass, then that next time we go out there, we're gonna write you a ticket. We've also changed the way we write tickets. We no longer write tickets to tenants, we write tickets to the property owner. So um, if, if, you're, if you own that property, you're responsible for that property. Um, so, so we write whoever owns that property a ticket. So we no longer write tenants tickets in the city of we write landlords tickets if they own the property and they, they have a violation. We, we every year at my training I tell the landlords, which is one of the reasons I'm not very popular, is it, it's it's the city's responsibility to hold the property owner responsible. And it's the landlord's responsibility then to hold the tenant responsible. And and there's things in place that a landlord can do to get rid of a bad tenant who's costing him money by getting tickets. And that's a legal eviction process. The city can't legally evict that tenant, but the landlord can. So if we tell we write a ticket to the landlord. You know, we expect them to, 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 to make sure their tenants following our ordinances. So we go out there the first time, we write you, you a ticket, we post a big orange sticker on your house and give you five days um, to correct the, the problem. If you don't correct the problem, um, we then we issue a work order to our contractor to go out and fix the problem ourselves. So he'll go out and cut the grass. So he, our contractor goes out and cuts the grass. If, if you don't pay that bill that we send you, so we pay our contractor $25 to cut the grass. We put a $75 administrative fee on it. So as the property owner, you get a $100 bill from us. If you don't pay that, that bill from us, um, it goes on your property tax the next year. All right. So. <laughs> yes. OK. okay. Um, no. <laughs> uh, can I jump into that question? This is a really good question because the county typically handles the, the, the property tax in the building, right? Um, we actually, uh, yeah, he asked, he, so the property tax is usually a function handled by the county, although the county assessor is the one, I mean, the county tax is the treasurer usually is the one who sends the property tax bill, so our, our city manager came from the county. He was the county administrator of Peoria, so he has a really good relationship with the county, so they have a, a joint task force of uh, county board members and city council members, and that was one of the first things we brought to them, saying, if we have these liens on, on these properties because you didn't pay us the money you owe us, will you put a special assessment on their property tax bill? And they said yes. So every year... How is that legal? Uh, it's <laughs> state statute allows them to do that. State statute? Yep. So if I don't pay your city fines, if a property owner doesn't pay your city fines, you're going to put an extra fine on the tax bill, and then if somebody can't pay their tax bill, then they're going to have problems there also. How do you justify yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you should <laughs> cut your grass. <laughs> I'm, we're not grass cutting big deals, but I'm talking about how do you justify doing that, causing somebody else an extra problem on their tax bill? You know, some of these these older folk can't afford to pay the tax bill the way it is. The, the way I justify it is. Is I'm hired by the city of Peoria to enforce the ordinance. Put a lien on the property. That's how you get the money. I, when, I, when the I, property sells, you get your money first. I, I, the four of us are hired by, by the city of Peoria to enforce the ordinances that our elected officials put in place. So I justify it by if, if the elected officials who represent the citizens 
put an ordinance in place and we enforce it, and, and you get a fine, but then we're going to do what's in our power to enforce that fine. You're, it sounds like you're going to be giving older folks who want to fix income problems with their tax bill. Is what it really sounds like to me. That has not seemed to be the case. Uh, thanks, Carol. Uh, I'm here for a couple of reasons. And I, number one, Carol invited me. And then uh, number two, I thought I might learn something, and I have. So I, I want to thank you folks from, from Peoria. Um, I'm frustrated. Um, for two reasons. Number one, I, I hear you saying that a lot of what you've been able to accomplish in Peoria has because you have a proactive city government. Uh, I'm frustrated because we don't. And, um, and I'm going to single out this administration. Current administration, they're not the only one. We've had many administrations before them that I would rank in the same, same category. But there seems to be um, a, a mindset in our city government that there are some neighborhoods in this city that are more important than others. And there are some neighborhoods that they just don't give a damn about. Um, and I can, have, I can give you some examples of that. That frustrates me. I don't know if it's a, a, the type of city government that we currently have, the structure, and I think it is, because I think power is too much power is in one place, but we have what we have. What is it about Peoria's government that we could learn from that we might be able to move past this, this stalemate, if you will, in getting our city government to be more responsive to its citizenry and, in, and more responsive and, and more caring of those older neighborhoods? And we have a lot of those here. Um, so, can you give us some insight on that? I was kind of the data guy behind the wellness plan, and I think that what you see here, this none of this was, you know, we had no idea what this map was going to look at. We plugging in the data, it was all by census track, and, and um, we had no idea what it was going to look like. So I think that this is a completely data-driven map, that there's no politics in this, and, and throwing the red, yellow, blue services around, or red, yellow, green services around it, at least from the, the data collection side, is that we had no idea what it was going to be like. If we didn't try to single out, you know, this is this neighborhood, we, you know, anything like that. So from the, the wellness plan standpoint, I can kind of vouch for that. that there was no intention of it other than we need to figure out what we're going to do with what area. And Joe, can I go in more detail? Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know enough about the city of Springfield or the elected officials or the departments to, to, to say one way or the other. Um, you know, I think you know all of the things we've talked about that we're doing. You know, I, I don't want to paint this picture of Peoria that, that what we've said is is fixing everything. I mean, it's not. You know, it, it's 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 trying a different approach to things, and, and, and things work, things don't work. And, and if you ask some residents of Peoria, you, you probably get some of the, the similar comments that that everyone has. And 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 I don't know the answer to your question of, of what what is different from our, our elected officials compared to your elected officials, what's better, what's worse, what's what's in the city government. I'll just say, you know, we're more than willing to, to talk to, to, to the resident, to, to you. You know, we have information, and, and I'm sure that your elected officials and your city government, if, if you took any of these programs to them and had a discussion with them, you know, they, they would be happy to talk to you. I can say from our experience, you know, when residents come and talk to us, sometimes they, they leave with a different perspective than they had to start. Um, so that is my <laughs> best answer that I can give in the form of other people. I know you don't have an answer for Springfield, I, and I appreciate your, your, your willingness to even listen to my question. And uh, my other frustration is that, and I think I share this with Mike Higgins, who's in the room today, is that all of us will. In, in the past, we leave these kind of meetings and we have great conversations within these meetings and we, you know, rah, 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 and we'll go out the door and nothing, absolutely nothing will happen because we don't, we don't make our city government, our city leadership step up and do the things they ought to be doing for, for us as citizens, all of us as citizens. I'm going to step in here and ask Joe to say just a couple more words about the composition of your city council. You already explained to us that you have four, uh, and I'll just let you know that I'm interested in hearing you say again what you told me about how the effect of decision making on that composition. Um, you know, 
Our city council is made up of five district council people and, and five at-large seats who represent the entire city and a mayor. Um, so, so with the wellness plan, you know, the, the, the plan, you know, represents the, the city of Peoria. It's, it's what is good for the city of Peoria. And, 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 and the, really the hard part when you're talking to council members about, you know, whether you represent this area or this area or this area, we're not giving you better or worse service. And I honestly believe that. It, it's, it's what does your neighborhood need? And, and, and it's the district council people and the large council people really stepped up and, and showed leadership and said, you know, this plan, we need to try this for, for the city of Peoria. And, and, you know, the key thing isn't better or worse service. It's different service, different levels of service for different things. You know, for one neighborhood, it might be more important to tear houses down, get grass cut, ASAP, and then reach out with our grants and see what we can do to help. For another neighborhood, it might be for us just to leave alone. Um, for another neighborhood, it might be us to take that one house that's on the back that's a blighting influence and really focus on that block. Um, so it's really taking a look at the whole city and, 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 and you know, coming together as, as not a council district or, or, or a, a neighborhood in town. And this is it's refreshing that, that we have in Peoria a Neighborhood Alliance that's a group of all the neighborhoods and, and they meet once a month and, and they come together as a group and really spearheaded a lot of issues of the city of Peoria as a group because, you know, they're being unified. There's, there's a lot of power in the unified voice of, of what we want to see in your neighborhoods. And, and our neighborhood alliance, you know, has a very good relationship with the city of Peoria. We meet with them frequently to, to hear their needs. And, and they don't always agree with, with what the city is doing or, or you know, the, the East Village Grow Cell TIF, you know, with the AG grant. The AG grant's for a specific part of town. And so when you, when you apply for a grant for a specific part of town, it, it, it can ruffle a couple of feathers in other parts of town. And, and, and we're not saying to, to any part of, of Peoria that, that we're not going to help you apply for a grant. It's this grant was good for this part of town because these things were in place. And, and, and we're more than willing to sit down with you and see what you need for your neighborhood. Yes. Uh, did you, um, you mentioned that you have a on your opening, you shared the data that you collected. You had like 10 data points that you were collecting. So I'm wondering if you can go through those a little bit slower and talk about what those are. And also if you can reflect on, you said you have a city council, a city county like joint task force and talk a little bit about how that works. Um, she just gave you a list of all, he just, sorry. They gave you, so, the statistics that we came together, we had about 22 to start. And we realized with 22, that's too many. So we came together with 10. And these were the 10 we came together that we felt had the little, the smallest amount of influence that, that other things, like that the opinion was taken out of. And, and, and these are the 10 we came up with. Um, and, and the other thing we, we felt very important was to look at census tracts because every year they're going to collect census information. And, and if, if you're not getting a map, we'll, we can provide a parallel email and you can send it out to everyone to see all the, the statistics. Um, it's important for us to, to do it by census tract because we wanted in five years from now to then pull up the census data and it'd be there again. Um, you know, we. Aren't, don't have Eric did all of the data for us, so he's probably very happy that in five years he doesn't have to go everywhere trying to find the data again. So it, it, it's very helpful to, to go by census tract and looking at data for us. And, and the other question about the, the city county initiative together, yes, it's a it's a I think monthly meeting, and, and three city council members and three county board members get together, and, and they're really working on on what they can do to share services between the city and county, what we can accomplished together. Sometimes things come out of it, sometimes don't, but, but like I said, one of the a really awesome thing that came out of it was the ability to, to a different way to collect funds. And so I have a thought, they've given me the list now, so that helps. What does mortgage lending, what does that mean? What does that measure? It's the, one of the, the national institutions collects data on how much, uh, so if I buy my house for $100,000, then $100,000 is in that census tract. So they break it down by census tract. It just pretty much means the purchase, um, how much money was lent for residential purposes okay. in that area. What's EAV? 
equalized assessed value. So that's um, that would be all the property value in each census tract. And then I do have a follow-up question, if I could. So um, with this data, what other things have happened? Because like I'm looking at, if you have the data, say, for unemployment, have you had sort of this side benefit where you say, maybe you have a, a nonprofit agency that works specifically to target, say, unemployment or retraining. So is this data kind of overflowed to be able to say, not only are we going to help the housing and the color enforcement, but nonprofit or somebody, here's a good place for you to start to to try to target that need. Is that, has that come like as a ripple effect? Uh, we are getting that. Uh, that's, that's one of our goals in mind. We're, we're not quite there yet. The first step we felt we need to do is kind of the realign the city services. And then, and then that's kind of the, the phase two of the program. But I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that's, now that you have the data, it's okay. Now, now what do you need to do to move that data in, in a positive direction? My name is uh, Mary Garrett. I want to say uh, one of the strong parts a lot of times you believe in your neighborhood. Um, actively engaged in the neighborhood, it takes the neighbor in that uh, neighborhood to be active, actively engaged, number one. Uh, to measure that um, success, I think, in the activities and program uh, in that area of youth development, we um, did something in the neighborhood for the last four years, a community garden. We not only invest in our neighborhood, but the drug dealers voluntarily moved out the neighborhood because now you have a watch area where you're not gonna actively do certain things in the neighborhood. Two, we partnership with other people believing in us that we can make a difference in our neighborhood and we do activities uh, in the neighborhood that would involve families and that would also um, in, uh, involve the youth. Um, oftentimes, we wait for someone to come in to give grants. We didn't have no grants. We put our time, money, and energy in that neighborhood to make a difference. And then someone came along and said, hey, they're making a difference. Now let's partnership. So sometimes you have to step out there and make a difference, not waiting on somebody else involve somebody, volunteer-driven, cheerleader that want to make a difference as well. We could just, I guess, to piggyback or reiterate on that, in a lot of our communities, we do have that. In a lot of our neighborhood associations, we had that champion for um, a neighborhood who, who might have, for one point in time, gone on her. Or you might have a community organization who says, you know, we're going to buy this open lot and make it a community garden, we're going to start changing the, the way our, our neighborhood makes up. Um, and those are usually the people who want to call and say, hey, I got a complaint on a property, or hey, what's going on? And can I just simply talk to you and see what's going on uh, with the city? So we, we do have that there, and, and, you're, and you're right. For, uh, for neighborhood associations and, and for cities to grow and to flourish, yes, you, it takes the people who are in the heart of that community um, to take that initiative. And in some places, we have that. Uh, just like Springfield, you, you have that there. And in some places, you know, it takes a little bit of a force or, or a strong elbow or winning smile that Joe has to to, to, to motivate that. But but again, you're right. But as the city of Peoria and, and one of my position, one of my duties as a position is to find who that champion is and, and to constantly work with them to say, okay, these are things that we can do. We can partner together. We acknowledge what you're doing. Here's some other things that we might be able to help with, or here's some questions that we might be able to answer for you. Um, but you're right. If, if you don't have that at heart champion or or that organization or that neighborhood, you know, the mother of the block who's been there for 50 years who takes it over, um, or, or the church organization, then, then things are, are fly by night and they kind of crumble and they don't last. So it's, it's putting them uh, with someone who sees that vision, that sustainability to, to partnership. Probably the most problems in older neighborhoods stem from 
the rental properties because the owner occupied houses, those people, you know, they take care of their houses in general. So I'm curious, uh, does the landlord registration ordinance apply to all landlords, even those who rent just single family homes, or is it only a certain number of units? And then how is it enforced? What's the penalty provision if somebody doesn't register? Um, our, our landlord ordinance is, is, the way our ordinance is written is all non-owner occupied dwelling units need to be registered with us. So what that means is if, if you have a rental unit, so apartment complexes, duplexes, triplexes, if you're renting it out, you need to rent with us. But what it also means, because it says non-owner occupied, um, if it's a vacant single family dwelling, you also need to register with us. So essentially, if it's, a, if it's a single family home and you don't live there and you own it, you need to have it registered with us. So if it's, if it's vacant um, or a rental property, and the main reason we do it is because we want to know your phone number. So when there's a problem, I know who to call and say, you need to get it, get it fixed. Um, we want to know your, your proper mailing address. We want to know who your agent is, if, if you have an agent for your property. Um, and, and we want to open that line of communication, and, and then I want you to attend my landlord training each year, so I, I can tell you what you need to be to be a good property owner. Um, and and from if you don't register with us, it's a, it's a $150 citation, um, and then if, if you still don't register with us after a month, it, it grows from there. And then if the owner does not live in the Peoria area or lives outside the state, are they required to have a local agent? If they don't live in the Tri-County area um, around Peoria, then they have to have a local agent. Now, does this apply to even if, it's like if uh, a parent uh, you know, owns, a, owns the home and they let their grown children live there, would they have to register? We have an exemption um, for, home, for uh, family members, so you have to register with us, so we have your updated contact information, but, but you don't have to pay the, fine, the fee. Uh, Lord, the mobile architect. I have a question for you. I'm very impressed with this neighborhood services unit. I see that there are nine personnel listed here. What impact did that have on the local budget? Because all of these names here, or all these positions, look like they're already in the city. They just didn't reassign who they report to or duty. Is this a net zero revenue organization? Um, Yes, I, I believe um, a couple of police officers, they- Say that again. <laughs> um, yes, they reassigned. Are you um, all them? Did you hear that? <laughs> um, they, they may have, from the policing standpoint, they may have added a couple officers through a COPS grant um, that, that they took, but, but almost all the positions were reassigned. The code inspector was previously in the code enforcement division. The neighborhood development specialist was in the community development department three years ago. Um, and then the residential police officers and the other the others were reassigned. So this is basically just changing priorities. Correct. Not going and asking for new staff positions. It, it, it's our council um, put a huge emphasis on nuisance properties and nuisance landlords and gave us directive to, to also put the priority on that and that's what this team is doing. Thank you. Yeah. It does seem like your language and your attitude are so important. You know, your neighborhood service unit, York says, I'm not the city out here, I'm the city to, what can I do to help you, sort of. And you call your plan the wellness plan. Yeah, that's nice. And it also seems so important that you've been able to have the notion of what's good for the whole city. You know, it's not just this neighborhood with the loudest voice or that neighborhood with the loudest voice. All neighborhoods have their issues. How did you convince people to do a data-driven, not opinion-driven, but data-driven plan, and then how do you keep promoting and promoting <coughs> what's good for our whole city? Everybody benefits when, when we all work together and we all benefit. How do you engender that? I mean, you have started it, but like your data-driven planning, how did you, how did you get that going? I, I think, you know, I understand it's hard sometimes to, to, be, to not be territorial with, with neighborhoods and residents and really getting them to buy into what's good for the whole city. And, and, and you know, it really took our council, you know, it, it was probably a tough decision in their minds. What kind of, we presented this at a policy session on a Saturday morning that we sat with city council for six hours and talked about our neighborhood issues and what's important to them and they prioritized and, and they said, you know, we, we told them, what programs we deliver, what services we deliver, they told us what are their top priorities, how, how to 
they want the policy set on how we deliver them, and, and we went back to staff and created this to match their policy, and, and they've had the leadership to, to stand behind it and say say to their residents, you know, this that we need to see if this works, and and I, I to to get residents on board, um, you know, in different in different parts and different neighborhoods, um, it's really telling them, you know, and showing them, you know, in, in the red area that we've talked about, we. You know, when, when I take, when they had four code inspectors and now they have one, that, that's a tough sell at first. Um, but, but then I countered and said, well, last year I tore 30 houses down. Next year I'm going to tear 45. What's more important for you, that house two doors down to be tore down or that house two doors down for them to, to paint the peeling paint around the windows? And, and when you ask that question to the resident in the neighborhood, they're going to tell you, I want the house torn down. Um, and then when I say, you know, what's, what's more important? Do you want that grass to be cut every two weeks? Or, or you know, do you want that, that painting done? And, and they're gonna tell you, I want that grass cut every two weeks and I want that house <laughs> torn down. And, and that's the sell we made to them. And we said, we know going from four code inspectors to one, you, you don't like. We understand that. We said, but, but here are the things you will like. And if we can deliver on those for you, then, then, then let us see if this works and better affects your neighborhood. And then what we also told them is, is this is an evolving plan. You know, we're going to update the data points every two or three years, and, and if areas change, different services are going to be delivered. Um, and, and the other thing that goes right along with that is, you know, once we tear enough houses down, we're going to work on bringing development back to the area. If we tear six houses down on a block and there's six lots, we're going to work with our federal funds then to come to that block and say, hey, can you put up six six houses? Can you put a new grocery store on the corner? And that's more five to ten years away in those areas, but but that's the sell we made to our residents. And, and, and you know, they've said, okay, for now. But, I mean, that's, and that's the, the public impression we've gotten. And some are, and some people are still not going to be happy with it. I mean, you can't make everyone happy, but, but, but our, our leadership has, has stepped up and said, you know, Let's, let's see if this works, and, and, and that's where we're at two months now. From two months ago, that's to where we're at now. Do you know how many uh, registered landlords or absentee owners that you have? We have about 8,500 properties registered with us, and I would probably guess there's about 1,000 to 1,500 that are. Okay. And do you know what percentage of those are categorized as a nuisance? Property owners or landlords or whatever you want to call it. Um, not off the top of my head. Our news our neighborhood service unit have essentially we've we've identified about sixty different property addresses that they're targeting. Um, if, if we broke that out to if we declared some of those landlords as nuisance landlords, those that number could go pretty high because some of our bad landlords own a lot of property. So out of 8,500 properties, you have approximately 60 properties that actually... <laughs> no, we have, we have 60 properties that, that the neighborhood service unit has identified that, that they have a, a, a very strong criminal element. Meaning, if you go in our, our, all our ordinance are on Unicode, the whole chapter five nuisance, if you go to unicode.com, you can see all the nuisance ordinance. We have 61 properties that within the city of York that they're taking a hard, hard look at me. They're starting this nuisance process for them. From a code enforcement standpoint, we put about um, 900 to 1,000 properties in front of our hearing officer each year for, for structural violations. Um, so, you know, I can't, those are the properties the police have identified. Um, I'm guessing there's a lot more than that. We have, we have, just like I'm sure Springfield does an older house in stock, that there's a lot of problems. Um, we, have, we have bad landlords. We have a huge problem with vacant housing. We have a huge problem with vacant lots. Um, but they make, so they make everybody register whether you're a nuisance landlord or not. I mean, that's a very small percentage of the people you're prosecuting. You make everybody pay the fee just because you're a landlord or you don't live in that particular house. So everybody pays regardless. I mean, you could have been a landlord for 30 years and never even talked to a city cop or a city, got a city violation, but you still make them register every single property. Yes. Okay. What is the fee? Um, it's it's fifty dollars uh, per year, but if you attend the training, it's twenty five dollars per year per property. Per property. Yeah. 
I had my hand up earlier, but let me go back. <laughs> to this. Sam already asked one of asked one of the questions, but back to the um, the ordinance with if someone doesn't you know follow you know pay the fines and stuff, and you talking about foreclosing, I guess, or it takes nine years to demolish or take the property. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I didn't quite understand. No, um, when, when we started the. I hope an easy question and compliments to the city on listening to all of you. I think they're very lucky to have all of you. You said there's a neighborhood alliance to which the neighborhood associations belong. Can you put a percentage guesstimate on if this is the map of Peoria? How much of it is covered by neighborhood associations? It's a poorly framed question, but I hope you know what I mean. Um, I can't get you that off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I would, most of the neighborhood alliance is actually formed by neighborhood associations that make up our older parts of town. So the, 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 on the map, the, the first and second area, a lot of uh, the, the northern part of Peoria just doesn't have strong neighborhood associations. There are new subdivisions. It's very suburban out there. Um, I would say a large majority of, of the older neighborhoods are represented in the alliance. And we can get a little more specific on that, but a large majority of it. And you said that that neighborhood alliance group meets with somebody, whether it's you or from the city, every month? No, they meet together once a month. And, okay. and I would okay. say. Just like ICON meets. Right. Okay. Um, I would say that. Either separately or together, they probably um, the, the, we hear a lot from a lot of the members of the alliance. Maybe not collectively speaking as the alliance, but they're very they're very they communicate with us greatly about code violations, lights out, all that stuff. So, okay. so but we don't necessarily meet with them once a month, um, kind of unofficially. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Do you? Uh, for you, you factor in then the neighborhood priorities into your data in some way. You say it's not survey driven, you're not opinion driven, but it seems as though maybe the data might be missing something that, that a neighborhood could still consider a priority. Some infrastructure issues or uh, some crime areas that don't necessarily stand out. Um, the, the, it's, it's, the map really doesn't set the priorities that the city, the data wasn't used to, to really set what um, the priorities are for the neighborhood. Um, you know, that's kind of a separate process. It's really kind of identifying the areas and then, then working with council to identify the service level being granted to those. But from a priority standpoint, that's kind of a separate discussion we have with the neighborhood that, that this doesn't necessarily fit in with this. So the wellness doesn't include that neighborhood attitude or opinion about where they stand in the... The, the wellness plan identified areas, and then the next steps in that is, is working within that to identify priorities in neighborhoods. So the, the data didn't drive that, but, but yes, those are the next steps to see, okay, so, so this is where we're headed, but, but we're, you know, through the Neighborhood Alliance and other neighborhood associations, you know, and in your position, we are constantly asking about priorities, though, but but that necessarily wasn't driven from the data. Yeah. yeah, I just had a quick question about um, the process you follow in developing plans for neighborhoods. Uh, does city staff go out work with neighborhoods and be the instigator of these plans, or do you expect the neighborhoods to come to you with a ready-made plan? Um, more asking for your support. It, it varies, um, but it, in, um, in, in many cases, um, the city working with the neighborhood um, together cooperatively um, means are identified and then that results in the planning process and usually how it's done. So it's hard to say whether it's the neighborhood coming to the city or the city going to the neighborhood. It's usually a, a working together You'd have planners and staff there able and available to work with neighborhoods in developing some plans. 
Yeah, that's right. All the neighborhood plans that the city has done has been um, the planners working in cooperation with the neighborhood leaders. <coughs> about the impact zones you guys talked about choosing areas um, the two block radius that you built some new schools or in the process of building some new schools I'm just curious um, if you can talk a little bit about how the how the neighborhood has responded in those areas if you have um, any problems with crime or graffiti or destruction or like how how does that that new thing how is it received and how is it cared for when you're when you have um, other issues with crime and safety and, and that or or is that has that become a problem at all? Um, I, I think I would love to tell you how successful the impact zones were. Um, I think they had a lot of successes. Um, I don't think they've worked out as well as we would have hoped. Because um, you have an impact zone of two blocks, it, it doesn't really take into effect the whole area. Um, I think that that you know even if you look in that two, two block, you see some infrastructure improvements, you see some some rehab houses we did. Um, you do see a benefit to there. Um, it, it probably needed to be a little further, and that's kind of where that's why the, the Glen Oak impact zone evolved into the tip. Because we, we, I think you know, and Shannon was more involved in that, but I think you know we realized that that. That's great for those two block radius, but, but we needed to continue to take a step back. And, and then I think the other probably uh, fault of the impact zones is, is we started implementing them right around the 2008, 2009. So a lot of, you know, we were going to put services and money into those areas, but then the economy mm -hmm. went downward and there wasn't any extra money to do much of anything on, on a city level. Okay. Um, the new school, of course, and then the infrastructure the new sidewalk, that has a visual impact on the neighborhood. So from that standpoint, it has helped um, create a sense that there's something new in the neighborhood, there's an improvement. And I think it has led to some of the other um, efforts that we're undertaking now. But there is still privacy the concern when the impact zone was created. Crime is still a concern. So it hasn't, um, I think there's been an improvement in some areas, but it hasn't necessarily taken care of the crime. I think, I think specifically in the Glen Oak impact zone that we did, though, um, I think a lot of everything else that's evolved from that, from the TIF to, to the AG grant, um, to a lot of the stronger neighborhood organizations were kind of a result of the planning process that was involved with the impact zone. Um, because a part of that planning process was pulling in neighborhood groups, putting together stronger nonprofit organizations within those areas, and, and really getting everyone together. And, and luckily in that, they really seemed together, which is why with the AG proposal, we were able, they were able to form such a solid team for a solid grant application. So if I, if you don't mind me kind of building on that, did you, did you, when you went into these impact zones, what was the communication like within the neighborhood that was already there, and and how did that neighborhood and infrastructure impact zone? I mean, how did how did you coordinate that together? So there was a, a planning process as part of that, um, where in the areas where the new schools were, were being built, um, there, was, there was an open space meeting um, or several open space meetings conducted um, in each of those neighborhoods. So the residents were um, notified of the, of the meeting and um, brought in and expressed their the, the open space concept. Um, the residents really drove the meeting, and so they provided their ideas, their concerns, and so on. And it was all put, pulled together into a plan, which then led to the investment by the city and the infrastructure, the housing programs, and so on. So what, what's the economic kind of um, like? Who, what, what kinds of people live in that area? I mean, is, this a, is this a red zone? A yellow, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably border lot. I mean, it's in yellow on the map, uh -huh. but it, it, it's when, when you look at the data points, it was teetering on, on the red yellow area. It's probably the, the closest to the teetering. Area. I mean, it, it's an area that, that, that's really had, had some, some struggles in the last 15 years. And, and it still does with some crime issues that, that we're continuing. That's one of the uh, right kitty corner to the new school is where the residential police officer lives. So he moved in there. Um, he lives actually in an apartment above uh, the, the housing service organization that lives there. Um, so so he's now patrolling kind of that whole area. So so we're hoping you know that he moved in maybe nine months ago to a year. So so we're, we're continuing to be hopeful. <laughs>
that, that you know, we've expanded the impact zone and, and we hope with the, with the right things in the neighborhood, the crime element goes away. I mean, that, that's, you know, we can talk about a lot of things, but what residents really care about a lot is the, is the criminal aspect of it. And, and that's, that's why when someone asked earlier about, about the neighborhood service unit with the police department and the reallocation of resources, I, I mean, that's why we, we reallocated the resources to the police department to say, you know what, here's a unit, go after go after the criminal element in these areas. Thank you. All right, I want to thank um, St. John's and Dustin for hosting us, and thank you to our readers from Gloria, Shannon, Joe, Eric, and York. Um, I also want to um, thank our ICON members and neighborhood associations. They are the mothers of our neighborhoods, as, as Dora put it. And because um, one of ICON's goals is to raise awareness that our inner city has great neighborhoods to, to live in, I hope you'll um, stick with me while I, I mention a few names of people who helped plan this um, event. Certainly there are other people who are also mothers to our neighborhoods, but those include Jamie Adair from Mun Park, Steve Combs from Enos Park, Michael Higgins representing downtown Springfield and MacArthur Boulevard, Holly Boston from Harvard Park, Sharon and Daryl Rippey from Historic West Side, Marty Vandenberg from Knox Knowles, Susie Weisberg from Lincoln Park, Ruth and Mark Anderson from Near South Side, Karen Jacobs from Old Aristocracy Hill, and Bill Pastor from Vinegar Hill. All great neighborhoods to live in and all people who are involved in ICON and who give up their time to this organization. Um, as we're fond of saying, you don't have to do to live in a better neighborhood. Um, and although I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, I encourage you all to get educated, to get involved. Um, find out what's happening in your neighborhood. Join ICON, sign up for our email newsletter. Um, ICON monthly meetings are the last Monday of the month, um, and the public is always invited. Um, we hope to be having monthly conversations with mayoral candidates over the next couple of months and we're encouraging people to attend those. And of course, um, we hope you will attend our Aldermanic Forum, which is scheduled for January of 2015, because ICON has a vision of electing city leaders with vision. Um, thank you for attending, thank you for your questions, and for your interest in the improved revitalization. Thank <laughs> you.